What's going on? What's up? Oh my god, that intro was so cool. Yeah, try and uh, try and get you hyped before you get on that show and have to speak on record about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a glass of wine and we're enjoying wine and also going to be speaking on this podcast. So that is very true. Yeah. yeah. You know, I I don't drink at all, really, which you well know. But um, no. you know, I just like the taste of good. Alcohol, I don't know, like, like people, I'll, I'll drink rosé, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, rosé is a very non-manly thing to drink. <laughs> and, like, people look at me like, you drink rosé? Like, yeah, I like shit that tastes good, I don't know. It's well, you, brose, you, come yeah, on. Brose, brose. <laughs> oh, no. Is that your new DTC brand you're launching? <laughs> I've been oh, drinking about oh, brose. <laughs> That's like the uh, the white girl rosé. Now you got brosé. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. Equipment. It's probably like it's probably out already. We just don't even know. You think so? They just ha- it's too expensive to target us now because you know Facebook mm. ads is just way too expensive. So. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> probably exists. <laughs> yeah, make sure you keep this thing about a oh, fist okay. in your face. Right, you, right, right. Yeah, you sound good. Don't worry. Okay. About. Cool. Um, yeah, so thanks for thanks so much for coming on. You know, I was thinking of, of having guests on. You were on the short list because um, you do so much awesome shit. Um, and so we met quite a few years ago yeah. in Israel, actually. And you were the entrepreneur so in residence in Shopify, Shopify at the time, right? Yeah. And also running a couple of e-com businesses as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and what kind of e-com businesses were those? Um, well, I had one, which is a bra company. So that one was the first company that I'd launched. Before that, I was like at General Mills and Pepsi doing the whole corporate thing. So um, launching new products and then got kind of bored of that. So I started my first business and it was a sticky bra. So the things that you like stick onto your boobs without any. Totally. Do you know? I do that all the time. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So basically when a girl wears something backless, they wear these bras, right? Um, so is backless like so that means that implies there's no straps? Is that there's kind of no a, straps? Okay. It's just like basically glue and it sticks onto your tits. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> so <basically, laughs> like pasties. Yeah. No. Exactly. And so I saw a huge like white space in the market because uh, the bras that were currently out there they were like you know their B two B strategy was great but their direct consumer was actually really really poor and so I was like ding 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 white space. <laughs> um, so I quit and then I went to Shenzhen, China, created a bra that was like stickier. So I had like different nude colors and beautiful packaging and then started my business on Shopify. And also, mind you, though, when I started this business, it was a very different time. Like influencer marketing was very new. Um, also, Shopify was also very new. So when I started it, I was kind of like the first to kind of innovate and disrupt this category. And mm-hmm. so I got a lot of sales ended up selling it and then joining Shopify as the entrepreneur in residence. And it was great. Like I was there for two years and like went to Israel, met you and did a lot of cool stuff, like worked on Kylie Jenner's pop up and stuff like that, which is awesome. But I like really missed like launching shit. Yeah. Which is like what I think is like the most exciting part. Which is like what you're born to do, I think. I actually think so. A little bit. Like launching stuff. Maybe like later on, it won't be like businesses. Maybe it'll be like launching, I don't know, poetry. I don't know what it will be, but like, I just love putting stuff out there in the world and seeing how people react to it. I'm the exact same way, which you all know. I think that's something that we connect on a lot. It's like, there's something, I don't know, just infinitely intriguing about creating something from nothing and then, and then seeing it grow in the wild. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. And also seeing people actually interact with it. And you're like, oh, holy shit. Like, <laughs> they don't know that I was in the kitchen creating this and, like, they're eating that shit now. You know, yeah. like, you're like, ma. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget the first time I saw somebody eat banana in the wild. Yeah. It was like, like, we just launched it. We were in basically no retailers. Yeah. Um, you know, we had a Whole Foods order, but it hadn't been fulfilled yet. Yeah. And so we were, like, at this random little cafe. And there were these two girls that bought some of the chocolate ones just at the mm-hmm. register. And, you know, I, I kind of see, I see them out of the corner of my eye. I'm like, oh, no. I think they have some. <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Don't look creepy. Don't creep too hard. And I'm just I'm like watching them, right? I was like, I yeah. want to see what happens when they open the bag. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then you see them bite it, and then they kind of look at it, and they're like, oh, that's pretty good. And then they start eating the rest, like, 
Yeah. Oh, thank God they didn't spit it out. Actually, still to this day, when I see Barnetta in like whatever store I'm at, I'm at I get so proud. I like <laughs> brag about you to everyone. Like everyone. You're the and best. everyone buys it because I I tell the whole story and get everyone so hyped up and like everyone just buys a lot. And I'm like, <laughs> totally cool, yeah. Um and so with Launch Pop now, you yeah. are focused on just like launching all kinds of the newest, coolest shit, pretty much. Yeah, I mean like What's interesting is like my co-founder Eva and I started Launch Pop. I mean, we started it because we were like, okay, what are we good at? We're good at launching shit. Okay, cool. Let's launch a company that launches shit. Like, <laughs> it's interesting because we never used the word like venture studio or agency or accelerator. And I think that was an interesting thing that we did because we didn't lock ourselves up in a category. We were like, let's just launch shit and see where it goes. <laughs> and it made us kind of like flexible to pivoting a lot which i think is something that a lot of founders have trouble with like they tend to fall in love with something too hard at the beginning and then it's hard to be flexible right for us like we were so open to to anything so we're like okay let's just launch it and then it kind of evolved over time and so what we do is we like help founders launch their direct to consumer brands and so the founder will focus on product r&d retail and then We'll do everything direct to consumer. We're essentially like a full stack direct to consumer co founder. That's how I kind of position it. Um, it's like super immersive, collaborative. Uh, we take equity in all the companies that we launch and they also pay us a monthly rate. So it's kind of like a venture studio in that sense. Um, but yeah, like we focus on like health and wellness, food and beverage, and beauty more so. And over the past like two years, we've launched some pretty cool brands. Um, one is like Morning Recovery, which is the hangover drink that everyone knows of in LA. Uh, another one is like uh, Daily Gem. It's like this really cool vitamin that's positioned as like, you know, the most natural way that you should eat a vitamin. Another one is Rael, which is an organic pad and tampon company. And, you know, what happened over time was we were launching these companies and then all these investors were kind of like, holy shit, like, who is launch pop and so eventually we actually started making like partnerships with these vcs and now we kind of have a network and we are able to introduce our founders to these vcs when they're ready for funding or like their next stage of funding wow that's such yeah. a unique model right because when you think about um you know the traditional way to do it it's like oh well you know we're gonna go to you know sachi or whatever right or we're gonna mm -hmm. go to name your brand consultancy x um and typically it's like okay here's our three tiers of pricing you know uh, 25k 50k 100k and uh, we'll give you a couple designs and um you know make up some romantic bullshit copy whatever the fuck and then you just yeah. kind of like take it and do whatever yeah. um but rarely is it sort of uh, a, a deeper partnership than that mm -hmm. and sort of a, a long-term thing um and I think it's really interesting because it's it's a wise model in that you're you're planning for larger success in the future. Yeah, it's not so short term. It's not. Right? And a lot of people are so focused on just like the right now. Oh my god, yeah, everyone. It's like people don't understand that if you want to start a business, because everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. There are so many entrepreneurs these days, right? <laughs> and like they don't understand that if you're starting this business, you're in it for the next like seven plus years. Oh yeah. Right. And so your values as a person changes over time. Correct. Mm. So my values or what I've what my priorities were when I was 25 is very different now that I'm 29 and closer to 30. Right. Yeah. And so you have to think about, OK, if I start this business, will I still love it and be so passionate and will it still align with my values like 10 years later? So you have to think long term when you start something. Right. <laughs> and like. I don't think people understand that enough. I don't think so either. And you touched on something too, where like the ability to pivot is so important yeah. and, and, and partially it's because of that, right? Like your passions and interests change over time. And if you do just sort of put yourself in a tiny little corral, it's almost like, um, you know, if, if you have a fish and you only put it in a 20 gallon tank, it will only grow proportionally to the size of the tank that it's in. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you throw that same fish yeah. in the ocean, then it can get the size of a Volkswagen beetle. Yes. You know, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So like, so yeah, so, um, for us, we actually are really picky with who we work with now because like, obviously we've had a lot of success in the past. And so, 
whenever I meet with founders, like there's some criteria. So one, I have to make sure that the founder is in it for the right reason. The biggest mistakes I've ever made in the past, like two years of launch pop is accepting founders who are in it just because they wanted the, their LinkedIn to be CEO or founder. Ew. Yeah. No, legitimately. It was like, yeah, it was (laughs) so bad. Um, So the founder has to be in it for the right reasons. Two is I look at their product and their product actually has to be innovative and disrupting a category. You can't just like be an, a product and slap D to C on it and then be innovative. Like that's not the p- type of products we're looking for to launch. Like it actually has to stand on its own two legs without branding for us to actually work on it. Just because like, especially nowadays, there's so much junk in the world and it really frustrates me. Like mm-hmm. people are very thoughtless when it comes to launching companies. Like, there's so much junk, like packaging junk, but there's also a lot of junk when it comes to noise online, right? And yeah. I, integrity is like a really big value of mine and also launch pops. And it's like having integrity in your product and your word is like the most important thing for us. So. Yeah. And you can tell too, because, you know, you and Eva are like salt of the earth, you know, like two, mm. two of just like two like really good humans, Aww. you know, <laughs> and I know her less well than I know you, but like. That's one of those, it's like a really rare, like a rare earth element, really. Yeah. <laughs> that, like you don't, like there's not that many people that, that truly do have the best intentions in mind and do hold integrity su- to such sort of like high value and then yeah. also translate that value into the way that they operate their businesses and daily lives. Yeah. So I think that, that general thought is somewhat fascinating. Um, yeah. And it, it does sort of breed of a happier future in what you're doing as well. Totally. Right? Because, and, and I've made this mistake in the past too. Like, you know, you, you, you're you young, um, you know, you're, you're 21, you're whatever, and then there's some yeah. dude that's like, you know, 55, and he's got all these credits to his name. And you're like, oh, this guy must be legit. Yeah. <laughs> and then it turns out he's just a cocksucker and yeah. like just wants to fuck everybody over that he's yeah. ever met, but you just wouldn't know that by looking at his LinkedIn profile or whatever. Yeah. Um and so, you know, for that reason, I think it's, it's an interesting way to think about it. And w- when you guys started the company, did you sit down and say, like, these are our core values and these are the things that we're looking for? Or is that something that sort of developed over time as you started the business? So Eva and I were really close friends before we started the business. Like we were, we would always go out and we had so much fun and we would always go to like bars and stuff. And we, we would be able to kind of like get close to the manager of the bar or the bartenders and get shots for free. Like we just had really good chemistry together and you can see it, right? Like like whenever you see us, you can see that we bounce off each other really well. Um, So when, before we started the business, we were actually really scared to do something together because in her past, she has been burnt, like incredibly burnt by her co-founders. And for me, I used to have a co-founder in my first business that I had to buy out. And then that made me bankrupt. And I was like low in cash. It was really, really hard. So we actually like for three months, we kind of just like talked about it a lot. We were like, why do we want to do this? Um, What what do you see in the future for us, et cetera, et cetera. And then we decided to just try it out because we were like, I think it might work. And the crazy part is, is like we've gone through so much. Like the first year we actually like have so many stories where we are low in cash because like we weren't really thoughtful with cash flow. We kind of just like took equity and we were just like, yeah, this is so fucking cool. We have a portfolio. <laughs> no, we have a, we have a fucking business to operate. Like you need cash. We right? got rent. Yeah. We have rent and shit. And like, you know, there are moments when like, you know, Eva and I both like couldn't, we were maxing out all of our credit cards and we couldn't afford rent. So we could, we actually like had the, our landlords like knock on the door and we would just like spend all day outside because we were so scared to go back. And like, sometimes there was this one time when we didn't have enough food. So we actually like, I know this is really sad, but like we <laughs> actually like found algae on the beach. Mm-hmm. And like, if you boil algae, it's actually really good for you. So we like boiled algae and like we put hot sauce <laughs> on it and we ate it. Like we literally. It sounds delicious actually. I know it was great. Um, and there was one time when this guy was helping us with our financials and we actually couldn't afford to pay him. So he was like, just buy me dinner. And we actually didn't have enough cash for dinner. So we ended up selling our clothes and then getting enough like money to actually afford wine and cheese and bread. And then just kind of gave it to him, you know? So (laughs) through all of that shit, what was very consistent though, was that we just believed in each other. Right. And like, Um, I think like we also both do have the same values like we came from a very similar background our parents were immigrants and also entrepreneurs and we 
take care of our parents. Like we both play that role in our families. And so we both like value the same thing. And we both, we both like value, I think, money in the same way. Like it's not like something we want to collect to have for ourselves. It's always something that will like we value experiences, et cetera. And so I think those things are so important to discuss and like to find out about each other um, before doing business with anyone. Cause like when you get into a business relationship with them, you're actually getting like ultimately married to them oh, in yeah. some ways. Right. So you have to make sure that you guys talk about your life values um, and business values as well. I think. Yeah, I think so too. It's like, I don't know when, when, whenever people start, people are starting businesses, they don't think through all of, you know, what does five years into the business look like? Mm-hmm. What does 10 years into the business look like? Does this person have traits that are going to sort of metastasize later on down the road and sort of, you know, rear their ugly head and turn into something that you just don't anticipate. Yeah. Um, and on the flip side, some people will start businesses with their friends, um, but they're also not thinking about those same things. Yeah. Right. And so totally. it's like, whether it's a friend or, or not a friend, mm-hmm. you can sort of end up in the same situation if you're not super thoughtful. Right. Like there's some friends of mine that, you know, if I started a business with them, I, I, I think it would go well. Yeah. Um, and then there's some friends that I think I'm like, oh, I think we have different goals in life that yeah. probably want they'll st- they'll still be my friend in 10 years but if we started the business i can't say for confidence that we'll still be friends or business partners in 10 years yeah 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 totally and like um i think eva and i also understand that we both like we are not tied to a business idea we are tied to each other which is very very special because like before the business what we prioritize is our friendship and that's very uncommon with co-founders i know that but like we always put our friendship first so like if we feel like we're not close and connected as friends our business suffers a little bit and we can actually feel that correlation and so we always make sure to keep our friendship first and we prioritize it we spend time together we have fun and then business just happens it just like it goes well, like yeah. just naturally. It's kind of weird. That is interesting, right? Yeah. I mean, when you're super in tune with people, it's a different thing. Like, have you ever had, even in relationships, right? It's like uh, sometimes there's just like frequencies are off. It's mm-hmm. like, I'm operating on FM and they're on AM or vice versa at any given time. Yeah, and the yeah, same yeah. thing happens with like employees, you know, co founders, yeah. fuck investors for that matter, right? Yeah. Um, so it is interesting to, to hear the success stories, I think, because, yeah. um, you know, in, in large part, at least oftentimes when startups fail, a lot of it's due to founder issues. Yeah, no, 100 percent. I, I agree with that. And like Eva and I, we used to do everything together. So for the first year, we were all doing the same things. She would she and I would split the clients and then I would launch some brands and she would launch other brands. Mm. And then the second year kind of rolls around and we're like, OK, we can't do this anymore. <laughs> So we had to have that hard conversation of like, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? Right. And so um, there was a period of time when we literally didn't talk to each other for like like a month because we were so busy in our new world and owning that new world. And Mm. so that was like a transition period. But after we made that decision, our business grew like 100 percent month over month. And like. But I think that we still needed that year where we did everything together to create trust and have that communication. and like really get her hands dirty in all parts of the business so that now when I I'm doing my part of the business, I empathize with hers. So I'm not going to like fuck her over. Right. I'm yeah. going to be like, Oh no, I remember doing that. And that was really, really hard. <laughs> so I'm going to actually tell the client X, Y, Z. Interesting. Yeah. That really is an interesting great. perspective. You know, oftentimes if, if you're too sort of siloed in, you know, marketing or creative or finance or ops or whatever, and you don't actually know how it is to do the tactical functions of said position. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it's hard for people to empathize with the time it takes to execute on that thing or how to talk to a prospective client about said thing. Exactly. What's like the typical textbook thing is like salespeople will sell something and then leave it up to, (laughs) you know, the team to just like do it. And they sold this ridiculous timeline and this ridiculous idea to the client. Right. And so, um, it's interesting because we don't have that at Launchpad because I used to launch brands. So when I'm like selling or like talking to clients, I can speak directly to the activity that they're <laughs> asking about. So 
Yeah, that's interesting. Are, are there, you know, sort of you have a front seat uh, and and you guys have like a front seat and a shotgun seat, depending on which day it is, I think, like seeing these new brands start to drive down the road. How many fucking accidents do you see out there? Oh, my God. How many just fucking <laughs> yeah. uh, goosh, just fucking pile ups do you see just I got to imagine like, you know, you, you've been doing uh, it for a couple of years now. And yeah. so. I would imagine, you know, whether it's clients that you took on or didn't take on, yeah. like, I don't know even how to ask the question, but like, what percentage do you think have failed within the first couple of years of them launching slash what kind of horror stories have you seen and, and what lessons would you glean from yeah. those? I think honestly, it, especially when it's this early stage, it's all about the founder. Like if the founder, like I said before, is in the, for the wrong reasons, um, or they're not being thoughtful about what kind of product they're giving to the world and they just want to make a quick buck, like disaster. Yeah. Like that is like complete disaster. <laughs> and there's a lot of those people. That's the thing. Yeah, it's and like the young Jeezy strategy. Yeah. It's just like, I think like people don't really understand what it means to start something now anymore. Cause you have like all these you know, like people like influencers encouraging entrepreneurship and Shopify. I love Shopify, obviously. And I'm like, like we're doing so many things together, but they encourage like people to be entrepreneurs. Right. Of course. And like, I think it's great. Everyone should like try it. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to try and do it full time, like you have so many other things to consider. Like I always tell my friends this because every one of my friends who are who have a full time job, they're like, oh, I really want to do my own thing. And I'm like, OK, <laughs> if you can itch that scratch by like doing something on the side. Then cool, just stay in your full time job. If you continue to itch that scratch by like doing th something on the side, but it just itches all over your body and you literally are flaming up and you can't sit still, then go and try to do it yeah. on your own because it's so hard. Super hard. And it doesn't yeah. mean, and, and just because your whole body itches, it's like you got you got to get medicated for it. You got to get in your oatmeal bath of entrepreneurship, right? Yeah. And, but like then, but sometimes like some people just naturally are not good at it and or don't have the grit to keep it going. You know, unless like w when you're ready to take that, that leap, like are you prepared to take a porta potty Turn it upside down and just sip all of the shit out of it. Yeah. For a period of who knows totally. how long. And, and max out all your credit cards and not be able to go out anymore and eat like shit every single day for your company. Are you willing to let all of that go? And a lot of people can't. Most people can't. And, and, and oftentimes, and, you know, it's, it's interesting, too, because in, in certain aspects, things are more black and white than others. Right. Like, yeah. um, like, I think that everybody should be able to go play rec league basketball. Right. Or <laughs> everybody should be able to go to like, you know, a, a jujitsu school or, um, a, you know, a Muay Thai camp or, or a whatever. But that doesn't mean you're going to be a world champ. Right. right. Like just right. because you can go hit pads and keep in shape as your side hustle after work doesn't mean yeah. that's going to be your main occupation. I think entrepreneurship is very similar in that way. Yeah. Um, but there is this sort of fallacy that that, you know, anybody can do it. And it's true that anybody can try it. Yeah. Anybody can do it for a period of time. But, you know, to be the Steve Jobs equivalent, you know, the, the Conor McGregor, the Michael Jordan equivalent yeah. of entrepreneurship is a whole different thing. Yeah. And it's interesting because I work with entrepreneurs like from zero to one. Right. And then now that I've been running Launch Pop for two years, I can see my alumni founders going from like 10 to a million right now. Right. So like that is a whole other struggle. And people like it's interesting because like this, the zero to one founders are like mad struggling. And then they think that the goal is to get to one, right? Or 10. And they reach that. But it's even harder to get from 10 to 20 to 100. Like, oh, yeah. that struggle is like a whole other thing. You have like investor um, pressures. You know, you have like these targets that you actually need to meet now. Um, like, you're not just selling a dream anymore. You're yeah, not just right. selling potential. Like, it gets really hardcore in terms of numbers. So it's like, it's like, that's not even the hardest part. It's no. like the scaling and just the grit to continue, even when you have like a year of 
of lows. Right? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And, you know, like like what you were saying, it's it's also a numbers thing, right? Because, you know, going from, um, you know, it's it's so much easier just on a dollar basis, right? So if you're, if you're doing a million dollars, if you're doing a dollar in sales um, and you want to grow 100%, all you have to do is make two dollars right now if you're doing 10 million dollars yeah and you need to grow 100 percent, you have to, to make up 10 additional million dollars somehow mm-hmm. and so like as you scale you know your your growth of course naturally over time will become less on a percentage basis but as a number it always grows yeah it always grows so you know growing 20 percent of a billion dollar business is way more than growing 100 percent of a 20 million dollar business no, it's crazy 100 percent. Yeah. yeah and then you know, the whole like getting investors involved uh, also is like a whole other playing field that all of the founders that I work with are very new to because they're like first time founders usually. And that is something that you have to really understand is it's it's another beast. Like you could literally have someone on a team that just does that, like yeah. fundraising and dealing with investors and planting the right seeds and making investor updates like that is a whole other thing. Um, but you're taking people's money to like scale up your business because you believe it so much. Yeah. And do you, do you find that, um, you know, it's always fascinating to me because of course I grew up in the venture world. Um, you know, I, I bootstrapped a lot of businesses as well, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, at a very young age, I started raising venture capital. And so, um, especially with the advent of, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. What did you do? Do what? Like, what did you raise money for? Barnana. Oh, okay, okay, right. And, and Candy it. Lab. Right, 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 yeah, right. Yeah, both right. when I was in, in undergrad in, in college. Yeah, undergrad, yeah. Yeah, so I was early 20s. That's really early. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just. Especially back then, too. Completely unqualified to yeah. do that, like all of us are, yeah. before we do it. And nope. then it's like, check this no out. No one knows what they're doing. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, that's a, that's a funny thing. It's like, people think that, you know, they, they, they look at you, or they look at me, or they look at somebody else that's done you know, light years more than either of us. And they're like, oh, they must have just always known the path, you know, yeah. but it's not. No, like they were also just taking risks I know. and fucking cooking algae or yeah. whatever yeah. at some point, <laughs> you know, they're trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, but it's interesting to me because, you know, now um, and, and when we started, we didn't have sort of the the vast resource that is the internet of today with social media, um, with Shopify and, and things yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, do, do you see with, with DTC, yeah. do you see founders now um, sort of taking those retained earnings and just growing organically with what they can? Or are they focused still on raising venture money because the market, the capital markets right now are just so good and money is so readily available yeah. and great brands are not so readily available do you see them going down that route just for that purpose or or is it to get into brick and mortar or do you see any that are just kind of making it off of retained earnings with with higher margins and things like that i'm curious man every single year the internet changes so much like it's insane so like two years ago we launched morning recovery made 250k in the first month and then a million dollars over three months right and a lot of it was from um, we did it on Indiegogo, but we also did it via, via Facebook ads and Instagram ads. Now it's way too expensive. You mm. cannot just rely on being a direct consumer brand. Like, I don't believe that anymore. If you're starting something right now, you can't just rely on direct consumer. You need to be omnichannel 110%. Yeah, I know you'll take a hit on margins from Amazon and retail, but you need to because it's way too noisy right now. Okay. And also like... It's just interesting to see, right? Like Facebook and Instagram did work, but now it's all tapped out. No one gives a shit about Facebook ads. (laughs) Like no one is going to click on it. It doesn't matter what type of strategy you use. Like, yeah, everyone says like put, you know, paid on an organic, like put press on um, on Facebook ads or whatnot, but that still doesn't really work. Um, So in my opinion, one, there has to be some kind of new channel that is created like YouTube. I know is creating a, like a D2C council and they're trying to like really get some people to use their advertising um, dashboard just because like no one is really using YouTube right now. Um, so they're trying to get more D2C brands to use their advertising platform. Um, but there has to be something else. Right. And like, yeah. I still don't think retail is dead. I think that people are actually going to go back to retail because they want more experiences in real life. So I think people should invest in retail. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I think you just need to be on a shelf. A paid acquisition can just be like such a black hole oh, and yeah. you can just keep on just dumping money into it again and again. 
Um, and yeah, and like, I think that it's also interesting seeing that right now is a really hot time for DTC brands to raise money because a lot of venture um, partners really, really want to invest in it right now. So honest, in my honest opinion, I think people should capitalize on that when it's really hot and you have momentum in the industry and also if within your company. Yeah. Um, be mindful of like economic downturns, which might happen in the next couple of years because like there won't be that much money going into D2C, right? Yeah, or in, in startups in general. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, right now we're living in sort of like an absolutely unprecedented time in terms of, you know, the valuations that companies are getting, even pre-money, pre-revenue, um, you know, and, and, and also just the lack of, you know, when I, when I talk to VCs and angel investors and private equity folks, they're yeah. like, well, we just have so much money we're trying to deploy, Yeah. but we the deals we see are just are like just they're not that shitty. exciting there's yeah. not that many brands so there's more money than there is good brands to I invest think so. in i think so yeah so, one so thing, you should yeah, take advantage of it totally and the other thing that i, I was going to mention is that um now that it's so hard to get paid acquisition to be your biggest like source of um customer acquisition i think doing things that are unscalable are actually like the smartest things things to do so for instance um morning recovery the founder actually calls 10 customers every day so he gets like you know millions of sales you know per month or whatnot but he calls 10 customers every day just to chat 10 and surprisingly like yeah or retailers um sorry people people yeah like and like you and me exactly sitting on the couch yeah as soon as like yo what's up yo yeah and i that's amazing because like i asked him i'm like how many people actually respond and he's like everyone and they love talking to me because like Obviously, one, it's the founder, but um, the product is also in a really millennial space where they understand that it's a startup, et cetera. And so yeah. um, it creates this connection with them. And what they find is that those 10 people like purchase again, regardless of their experience with the brand. And then they talk about this experience of talking with the founder to their friends and it creates this ripple effect. Right. right? And then every month he actually has dinner with 10 of his customers. <laughs> He literally chooses 10 people. That sounds people. so fucking dangerous, bro. I know. How cool is that, though? It's amazing. You sit down, and it's so unscalable, right? But but it's so smart because you're able to like do have such a strong connection with a very few few people and we at launch pop we like do this online as well we create like private facebook groups and we do like beta groups and um we try to create a connection and community that way but there's something to be said when you actually do it in real life you know like a dinner or like a phone call it's like so much more personable yeah um and so that's like something that i that i hope like founders if they're if they're listening to to take away is like <laughs> do unscalable things because right now that's what's like winning that's what will actually create a ripple effect and like people talking in more loyalty. That is interesting. And, you know, even, even the food space, like, you know, and this is prior to sort of DTC's uh, emergence at scale, like it is now, um, you know, and, and one of those unscalable things is going in to the fucking store, yeah. standing your bitch ass behind the <laughs> table for three hours in, yeah. on the middle of a Sunday. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows who the fuck you are. Yeah. And you just, taking some tongs and some bowls and putting your product in people's mouths for three to four hours. Yeah. And it's, it's a similar thing. It's not quite as intimate or as immersive as, as, um, you know, a, a dinner per se. Um, but it is like, Oh, so what do you do for the company? Like, Oh no, I'm, I'm one of the founders of the company. And they're like, really? Yeah. Why are you here? I know, but it's so great. <laughs> it like, is. It's so awesome. Like, um, so my boyfriend, he's like the the CEO and founder of Myo Detox, and they're like basically physiotherapy clinics, but like basically the soul cycle of physiotherapy clinics. And um, it's really interesting because, you know, the advice that he gives people who have like physical retail stores or, you know, physical shops is that the first thing you should do is not like paid acquisition. It's literally go pick up your ass and go knock <laughs> on people's doors like the next door neighbor that you're, you know, you're beside and say, hey, I just moved into this new location. Come check it, check it out. Like go door to door and yeah. literally knock on people's doors saying like, I'm a new business in town. My name is XYZ. Come mm -hmm. and check us out. Like 
old school ways still exist and you should be able to do those ways before you get into paid. Right. Like, yeah, it's true. There's, there's like, <clears throat> there's, there's a tried and true things at work, you know? And, and it's like, there's, there's two, it's, it's very similar to a lot of things in life where people want to be on team A or team B team green or team orange. And you know, I'm on team billboards i'm in fucking billboards in print because it's worked for several years and i <laughs> advertise on cbs every time you know prime time and and like yeah some of that works and some of it won't work yeah and in a similar way it's like no it's just all about digital you know all yeah. we do all we do is social media and influencers and yeah. like well it works However, you do need some sort of a diversified marketing mix yeah, to really make I it work long term, I feel like. Yeah, I 100% agree. It's all about testing, right? Testing yeah. literally everything. It's about being creative about how you test your marketing tactics. Yeah. And yeah. do you see your brands, um, and this is often an interesting um, thing that, that I run into, are they selling on Amazon? Because I feel like there mm-hmm. is a general hesitation, and for some good reason, mm-hmm. to only sell on your, you know, davesbodyshop.com or whatever. <laughs> Whatever you do, I don't know what they sell at davesbodyshop.com. Shout out to davesbodyshop.com, whoever the fuck that guy is. <laughs> I, I bet you there is a davesbodyshop.com. Oh, yeah, fucking 100%. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> but um, hopefully it's not a porn site. Um, anyway, <laughs> fuck. Um, you know, uh, I don't even remember what my goddamn point was. <laughs> No, Amazon. So like, Amazon, yeah. Did, did you find, did you find yeah. your fans going on there, or, or what, what do they feel like? Yeah, so Amazon comes a lot later, and a lot of the brands that we launch actually don't end up on Amazon, mm. um, just because, like you said, they want to make you know they want their brand to be very you know premium. They want that connection with their customer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think it's so a good channel. I honestly think I it's think a everybody's good missing out. Yeah, I well, I mean, you you know you know about Amazon, and it works really well for you, right? Yeah. I think it's still something really important to to be on. Like, yeah. 100%. It's, I mean, if you want to scale your fucking business and not have to worry about your CAC or you're sitting behind a table or doing dinners and stuff like that, like, the difference between somebody finding you on Facebook ads or, you know, you, you trick them into giving your email, uh, mm-hmm. getting their email somehow, and then you, you know, send them through a click funnel um, you know, with a nice little automated campaign and all this shit, and yeah. um, or even it's through organic social or whatever it is, like, there is definitely something to be said for when people are on Amazon, they're doing one thing, thing. and yeah. one thing only. And you know what they're fucking doing? Shopping for shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just pure, pure and simple. Shopping yeah. for shit. Yeah. And I mean, that's the most qualified traffic you could possibly get. Yeah. No, yeah. totally. I agree with it. It's like, it's a very foreign place for me as well. Yeah, I'm sure. But it's like, it's also like the second uh, most used search engine in the world, right? Yeah. So like everyone's on it looking for stuff. Um, it's great for SEO. I think everyone should test it out, honestly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I would love to learn more about Amazon. Yeah, it's like I don't work whole, for Amazon, by the way. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a whole different world. Like the people who can like hack Amazon, I'm just like, holy fuck. Oh, you your boy. Yeah. You guys are probably like making like 10 figures just like doing affiliate marketing shit. Like, yeah. It's some crazy shit. Yeah. No, I know. There's like little groups. I know that <laughs> mastermind groups that just fucking rule Amazon marketing. I've seen it. It's insane. Yeah. It is really interesting. And so like, so you're launching all this cool shit all the time and like you're living in, are you, I guess Toronto's not on the coast. It's like coast of a, a, a lake, isn't it? Isn't Toronto next to the lakes? Yeah. I mean. So whatever, you're like kind of bi-coastal. <laughs> no, well, I mean like I grew <laughs> you're doing up, this. I was born and raised in like a really small town outside of Toronto called Waterloo. And then I went to school in Toronto and then I worked in Toronto and then I moved to LA like a year and a half ago. Okay. Um, and like, it's interesting. Like, Toronto and LA are just so different. And you go back and forth, right? I do. Like, actually, half our team is in Toronto. I just find that, like, Toronto people are just, they work really hard. Yeah, it's different, isn't it? Yeah, they're like, well, they also have, like, less opportunity because, like, there's less cool companies there. You know what I mean? So, like, I think getting in Canadian employees is actually, like, a smart thing for U.S. people. It's just, like, obviously, we wish that we could have them in L.A., but... The talent is just there in, in Canada. Oh, that's so interesting. So like, yeah. so you're doing that and you're, you're semi-bi-coastal. I'm going to call it bi-coastal, even okay. if it is on a goddamn lake. Um, 
<laughs> and so like, all right, do so, you? Yeah. So you, so you're doing all this cool shit. Like, where do you find, how do you find balance when you're doing yeah. that? Like, you know, you're trying to date people and be a normal yeah. human being and yeah. maintain friendships. Yeah. And like, what's that been like for you? The first year it was non-existent. Like I started launch pop with my co-founder and then a month later I broke up with my boyfriend at the time. And then I was single for the longest period of time. I was always like a serial dater. And then this was the longest period of time I was single. So I was single for like a year and a half before I started dating again. Because I was just so focused. And honestly, I didn't have cash. So when you don't have cash, you can't fucking go on a date. You know what I mean? For sure. Especially not if you're a dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then you're really fucked. Yeah, it was, it was, it was horrible. Um, but now that I, we're so lucky that everything's like really turned around. And like, um, you know, we're doing super well now and stuff. and. Yeah, I think that it's interesting. I think one of the things that I practice like every single Saturdays is I airplane mode my phone oh. every Saturdays. And I know people are like, oh, my God, that's so hard. I'm like, no, it's actually not that hard. Are we talking airplane mode without Wi-Fi? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just without, making sure. Without Wi-Fi. <laughs> like, and at the beginning, I was like, it made me feel really anxious. But then... Now I'm so used to it. I crave that day. I crave Saturdays when I can airplane mode my phone and I'm literally just like alone. I can do everything that I want to do. And then on Sunday, when I go back to doing work, I actually notice that I'm so much more strategic and sharp in my, my, my thought of thinking, in my way of thinking. It's actually the best hack you could ever do. And like my whole business is online, right? So obviously I have anxiety around it, but dude, <laughs> nothing happens in a day. Like, you'll, you'll be fine. Yeah. You'll be fine. And so that's been, like, the biggest blessing to me to have a balanced life. It's, that, like, that one day. And then also, like, it's been interesting, like, transitioning out of launching companies and being more of, you know, like, I'm way more external facing. I do more finances now, right? It's, like, I've lost, um, I don't really do anything creative anymore, right? And it was actually kind of a struggle because, like, I crave being creative. I think that's, like, what I love to do. But then I realized, you know, this, my business needs me to be more external facing and doing more finance stuff. So it's fine. I'll do that. And my business doesn't actually need to be my creative outlet. So um, I started looking for like creativity outside of my company. Right. And like my company doesn't need to be my everything. That, that was my biggest learning. It's like creating space between me and my company. My company is just like a part of who I am. It's not who I am. Could not and, agree more. Yeah. So like, I used to really like feel depressed when my company was doing shit and really happy when my company was doing really well. But now that I've actually created that space on purpose, regardless of what happens to launch pop, I'm fine because I am still Jane without launch pop. That's right. But that took so much time <laughs> and so much practice and like to actually find self worth and self respect outside of your company. Man, that's so hard. It's true. I mean, you know, you're, you're, sort of defined by how you react in any given situation, right? And if you're defining yourself and, and no one gets to define you but you, right? And I think a lot of people forget that. And, and, and it's not necessarily that they're letting other people define them, which is absolutely a major problem. But it's also that you sort of just allow things to define you as you go through life naturally, yeah. right? And you see it even w with fighters and things, right? Like their whole life is fighting, and so they're that. Um, and then when the career is over and after you're done being a professional athlete, fighter, like it's hard to find something else because you've defined yourself by that only. Yeah. And I think the same is to be said for a lot of different facets in life and certainly in entrepreneurship. It's like you should definitely have interests and in things that make you tick outside of your yes, core business. I agree. And I think at this day and age, it's so... It's so popular to have to be the face behind the business because everyone loves the founder story. So it's like it's like everyone craves that. Right. Yeah. And, you know, Eva and I are both the face of Launch Pop. And, you know, me being like so external, I become more and more the face of Launch Pop. And that actually like it makes me feel so much more like my identity is defined by Launch Pop. And I have to do it for the business because it works, right? Like yeah. everyone loves the founder story, so I have to keep on pushing it. But I know the more I push it, the more I'm going to feel like I am Launch Pop. Right. And I need, to, I need to create that separation, at least for me, right? The out, outside people can think that Jane equals Launch Pop, Launch Pop equals Jane, but I personally need to make sure I remind myself like I am not equal to my business. 
Yeah. Yeah. And like, I, we talked about this before, but like, it's so important to be aware of what your narrative is. Right. And like, um, I think people, they create this narrative because, um, everyone loves stories. They love stories about, you know, I struggled and then I created this and then it became this and it's so sellable and marketable. Um, but it also traps you to only think of yourself in a very one dimensional way. And you stop thinking outside of that narrative. So like, you don't know whether like you would have been good at X, Y, Z. You just stick to your narrative because that's what you've been told you're good at. And that's what makes sense. That's what pays the bills. Um, and that is you, but is that really you? Right. I don't know. I don't know either. Dun, dun, dun. It's part of you. It's <laughs> yeah, part of yeah, you, right? Yeah, it is. But it I do is. think people, you know, it, it, it's definitely good to specialize in, in at least one thing to the extent in which it can propel you to sort of the next stage in, in whatever your grandmaster plan is, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but simultaneously, I think you absolutely have to look outside of whatever your core craft is at the moment and foster other things that are difficult to do and enjoy the process of just sucking shit at it for a little while yeah. until you slightly you get us a little bit better. Like, yeah. you know, jiu-jitsu is, is very similar in that way and that, like, no one is good at that the first day literally nobody you can't be because it's such a mental game and that will destroy your ego in such a fascinating and unique way i mean it's just demore whatever amount of like strength you think you have in your body it'll get sucked out so fast when somebody's on your back choking there's nothing you could do um and it's things like that right and i think you know we were talking about this again a little bit before we started recording it's like you'll climb you'll start climbing some mountain that you see some peak Right. Mm-hmm. And you get two thirds of the way up and you look up to the mountain and you see a little snow cap and then you see more of those in the distance. There's like infinite amounts of them everywhere. Mm-hmm. And you can't actually reach the peak of this particular uh, p- the, the particular mountain that you're on. Um, and so you, you have two choices. You can sit there and just try to, to pass the impassable mm-hmm. on the trail or you can go all the way down to the bottom and then hike up a brand new trail. Mm-hmm. And then maybe to get to the top of that mountain. And then you have to go back down and then Mm -hmm. climb another one. And a lot of people don't want to start the new climb of any kind. Yeah. And I, I understand why, but aren't you curious? You know, like, I I don't know. I would always like encourage, I'm, I think I'm at that place right now with my life. Right. I think that, um, you know, I, my business is at a point where it's like pretty stable now. Um, and it's growing and it's really healthy and, now I'm at a point where I'm like, okay, cool. I love my business, but like, you know, four years later, what is going to be my purpose in this world? What is next? And so I'm, I'm thinking about these things and it's like, I have these interests, you know, I, I've recently like picked up painting and, and like, I'm like, fuck, fuck like, yeah. I know I'm like, fuck, like, what if I actually like, I'm good at it if I, I if I actually painting. try it, you know, like right now I'm like shit, so whatever, but doesn't matter. yeah, but what if like I actually like dedicated as much time as I did on my business to painting, like what would that look like? You fucking with acrylics or oil or mixed media? Dude, I started with watercoloring and it oh, was yeah. so fucking hard. Yeah, watercolor is difficult. It's so hard because you have to like start with the lighter colors first or Blending, something. Blending, baby. Man. And so like, and then now I'm in oils and stuff, which is like much easier for me to be yeah, honest. So of course. Yeah. But yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those things too. And you know, me growing up, that's something that I would always do, and I, I still do. It's like I just want to hone. I want to learn new skills and just fucking sit you're there. You're so good at and that. Sharpen though. them like an axe, so it can just chop through. No, anything. but you're the most like you. You play instruments. You sing. You do jiu-jitsu. You like ride a motorcycle. You have all these different things in your life. Like, yeah. you, like you are such a good example of an entrepreneur that's able to like, like be fulfilled and like burn on is one facet obviously that fulfills you but there's like others that are coming in and, and exercise different parts of your mind that you're not using while you're working on banana yeah. right and it helps and it, everything yeah and it makes you healthier as a general human being yeah 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 for me if i don't do that i will go insane like if i'm not doing that other stuff i will yeah. fucking go crazy like i yeah. have to be doing i have to be doing physical activities i have to be learning some kind of new language new skill yeah. new this and that new project creating something and and that's just the way that my brain works yeah. and you know i don't think that that maybe most people would want to 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 have that sort of brain necessarily but i have to do it or i'll go fucking yeah. crazy uh, yeah that's interesting because like 
So, um, so you and I both have to be thought leaders, quote unquote thought leaders, right? Yeah, we're thought leading right now. Yeah, fuck that. But like, <laughs> <laughs> but like it's like my job is to be a quote unquote thought leader. Because mm-hmm. like I'm, you know, like we're in the D to C CPG space and we have to like talk to press about it. And so we always have to act like we're experts at something. Right. Like, but we really aren't. Like, you and I both know that everything changes all the time. So, like, we're never going to be an expert at anything, right? No. Um, but it's interesting to to see, like, us being a quote-unquote thought leader in one one sense and us being a total noob at other other things. Like, how we, like, react to those things and how we feel about it and... Yeah, it's just such a different world. Yeah, it's about like, you know, being very comfortable with the uncomfortable, mm-hmm. right? And like, you know, I feel this if I if I go roll jiu-jitsu with Ivandro Nunez, right? Because like when you, physical things are just so cut and dry, you know? And like I'm a blue belt in jiu-jitsu, I can, I can, I can do some shit, you know? But then you get in there with a high-level black belt yeah. and... There's you're just getting d- 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 demolished yeah. and like I'm definitely not an expert in that. And there's something humbling in, you know, trying to explore something new that yeah. you're not an expert in and being a novice. Yeah. It's oh my a God, good so feeling true. being a novice. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So as long as your ego allows you to do it, it'll be helpful. Yes. So that's the big part. Right. So I think that a lot of your 20s, you're just trying to build up your ego. Right. And you're you're doing, you're just building it up, building it up. And then I think you reach a lot of people like you and I, you know, you have your business, you built it up. It's pretty sustainable. And then you reach this point when you're like, okay, I want to break it down again. I want to break all of that down because there's such beauty that you can see if you break down that ego. And like, not a lot of people get to that stage because like some people stay on that, that mountain forever where they're just trying to build that ego up and chase all the other things but some people get to break down their ego and start from scratch and be humble again and then learn stuff again um and that's like a whole other other journey that i think i'm i'm on right now yeah yeah i think it's i think we're all on the journey and the only difference is a lot of people don't realize that they are Mm. you know it's like everybody's gonna get old Every day is going to pass and that clock stops for no one. Yeah. It's not stopping for you yeah. or me or, you know, the guy or gal that is spending 50 years at Kellogg's or whatever it is. Like yeah. the clock's ticking every day and like, yeah. well, what do you want to do with it? Like be totally. thoughtful about that. Yeah. And like I was telling you this about um, this retreat that I went to before we started recording, but basically... I was at Palm Springs with 45 women and everyone was like, you know, there were like 25 year olds up to 65 year olds. So like there's a huge age gap. Um, And then everyone had a different background. You know, there was a neuroscientist, uh, an investigator for blood diamonds and like a lawyer and, you know, someone who's studying space. And and I was the only person in e-commerce and like, you know, investing. And so it was really refreshing to not be able to I didn't really talk about D to C or e-commerce, which was super, super refreshing. Um, And we were just able to like talk as women about like larger issues and things that we were thinking about and like self-identity and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I just think that people can get really trapped trying to like, you know, own a niche and be an expert in a niche and be ex like just own that one thing that you want to be really good at. But it actually is so good for your brain if you just, speak to other people in different walks of life that have done different things and think about things critically from their perspective. It just like massages your mind a little bit differently. And you'll notice that when you go back to the thing that you're an expert in, you just see things differently a little bit. That's true. It's so important, I think, for people to do that once in a while. I think so too. And there's so many different ways that you can achieve that, right? It's, it's by surrounding yourself by people that aren't in exactly what you're doing, right? And you get mm-hmm. outside perspective. And maybe you're just talking about, you know, colonizing the fucking moon or whatever yeah. it is, you know? <laughs> um, or traveling the world, right? Like, yeah. I go to Thailand every year to go train Muay Thai and meditate as, as sort of just a, sort of a mental retreat and reset for me um, to do bigger planning and strategic thinking and, and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And 
you know, it's it's very similar to that. It's like, it's, oh, this is a whole different thing. Yeah. No one thinks the same way that I do or anybody in L.A. Like, it's a truly different spot. And anybody who's traveled the world, unfortunately, that over the last couple of years I've been able to do so, I was never able to, as, as you know, you well know when I was younger. Yeah. Um, and the third way to do that is through psychedelic drugs. Yeah. Like, sometimes you'll sit there, <laughs> you'll go to an ayahuasca retreat or do some LSD you with your loved one I, and, or mushrooms and all that kind of stuff. What have you done? Uh, I've done a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm a true believer in, in in psychedelics being used for a very specific purpose. And yeah. the way that I think about it is, you know, about once every year or 18 months, something like that, yeah. um, anywhere between 12 and 18 months, typically I'll do one psychedelic experience with um, typically someone who's really, really close to me that I've known right. for a long time. Yeah. And the way to do it is you sit there and you meditate beforehand and set an intention. Um, and each time my goal is to walk away with sort of a key insight. Yes. Um, and it just helps you see the world in a fundamentally different way. And doing that, no. you can't help it. Yeah, I 100% agree with with everything that you said. So I use psychedelics as well. Um and my intention is always to, to walk away, to learn something about myself or to refresh my mind, right? Um, yeah. So the, I, I've had like two recent experiences. So one was on shrooms and, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I went through the whole thing. I felt like puking and then I saw all these weird statues rotating around in a circle. It was all fucked up. Awesome. And then I came out of it and was like, oh, my God. My purpose in this world is to create beautiful things. And it was such a simple statement, but I was just bawling after that because I realized that, honestly, I think that is my purpose in life, creating beautiful things. And, like, that came out of shrooms, right? Yeah. And, like, you and I are both privileged that we can actually, like, you know, do psychedelics, first of all, and not, and, like, talk about it openly because I think, like, other people, if they were to talk about psychedelics, They'd probably get like arrested or something. Yeah, I'm <laughs> but, not like, scared, homie. Come at me, bro. <laughs> yeah, like we're like really privileged that way. But yeah, I think um, it's like if used correctly with the right environment and the right people, like what you said, it's someone close to you, um, and setting the right intention, it can be like life changing to you. It can, yeah. It's a yeah. tool like anything else, right? Yeah. It's like you can use a hammer to build a house, or you can use a hammer to murder a hundred people at the supermarket. Yeah, it's up to you. It's interesting because there was this like really um, big study that happened. It was called the Rat Jungle um, Jungle Park. Do you know about that one? This is the one where um, they're all bored and they're doing a fuckload of coke or whatever, yes. and then they give them cool shit to do, and they're just like they're, hanging out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this one scientist, he does this big study, and he puts like rats in a cage, and there's like heroin and cocaine dripping. Um, and so the rats end up going to that drip like every single day until they kill themselves. Um, this other guy comes in and he's like this hippie dude, right? And he redoes the study, but instead he like makes a park for them. He creates a space for sex and then he creates like a little wheel and like food. And what ends up happening is that the rats actually go very occasionally, um, but only for recreational purposes and they just live a long, healthy life. Yeah. So it's like, that just goes to show that it's like it's just like the environment that you're put in, right? Yeah. That really affects how you react to the to the drugs. It's very true, and <clears throat> you know, with psychedelics in particular, it's it's one of those tools where it definitely there's no you know you can meditate and achieve a similar state, but it takes a lot of practice, mental fortitude, yeah. you know, sharpening of that skill. But with psychedelics, it is a hack in that you're not staying in this world it's not possible for you to control that and in fact you have to let go of it because if you don't then it will turn into a negative experience very quickly yeah and oftentimes the things that you do come away with are are so simple but it does give you strange clarity like for me the most recent one i came away saying you should never tether yourself with anyone or anything that is based on a relationship that isn't based purely on love and understanding Hmm. You know? Yeah. Love and understanding. Every yes. single thing you tether yourself to in this life should be based oh, upon those that. two I things. Love the word tether. I love yeah. That. And I and it, you know, I'm sitting yeah. there on the beach with my brother, yeah. staring at the sand in the ocean, and it was just like the craziest epiphany. Um, and it sounds dumb now because it's just some very simple statement. But when you truly internalize that and then mm. implement it, it can mm. change a lot. Yeah, for sure. Um, the other experience that I had, I actually, 
did it something a little bit different and I actually looked into my memories and I found a couple memories from my past that I, I had suppressed when I was a child. Um, and it was like on purpose because I think it was very traumatic. And so psychedelics allowed me to bring that up again and face it. So that was actually really, really hard um, yeah. because it brought up so much pain from the past that I had completely forgotten about. I literally called my brother and my brother was like, wow, I actually don't have memories from that age time as well because like that was very traumatic for both of us um and like it it was interesting because like that I had to I still feel like I'm processing it it's been like a month and a half but it's made me really reflect on like um you know my current relationship and like my relationship with my parents and with my brother um and just I was able to forgive a lot as well so like um yeah, psychedelics can be used for a lot of clarity for like the future, but also for the past and healing stuff from the past that you haven't faced, you know, because you were too young to face it back then. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny before we started uh, recording, you're like, so is this like, you know, about business and stuff? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I can't believe I'm talking about this, but I'm so cool with it. Like, yeah, look, it's one of those things that are being destigmatized, and, um, you know, Denver just voted to decriminalize psychedelic mushrooms. Um, yeah. Shout out to Denver. Fuck yeah. Shout out. Shout out. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's like, it is one of those things where, you know, and maybe I just have a generally libertarian perspective on, on most mm-hmm. things, but it's like, look, if you're an adult and you're not hurting anybody else, do whatever you want. Yeah. Right? Like, marry your couch. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. I don't care. You know? Uh, that's drink, a funny example. Drink some alcohol. Fucking, what, what, why do I care what you do in your own four walls? Doesn't concern me at all. Yeah. Um, you know, and if you want to do psychedelic mushrooms, go ahead. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah, yeah, as long as you don't go outside and start like, you know, fucking yeah. shit up. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. You, you generally have to be in a good state to do psychedelics. You can't That's be, right. like, depressed. You can't no. be You can't be shaky. Like, you actually have to be in a good place with yourself and with, like, everything else to have a good experience with it. That's right. People find it hard to get there, right? So I think, like, yeah, people, like, yeah, you and I, I think we can do it. And, like, a lot of people do it. It's just, like, just make sure that you're in a good space. Like, I think it's... Yeah, it's set and setting, you know, it's like, where are you doing it? You know, why are you doing it? You in the good, you in the right mind space for this, you know? Um, And, you know, what's interesting too is like that, that translates into so many different aspects of life, right? Like Mm -hmm. if you're, if you go into a situation and you're anxious, you're probably not going to perform at your best. Yeah. Unless you find some mental uh, tool to say that anxiety is actually just excitement. Yeah. And then you just switch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, it's like how do you, how do you sort of take whatever thoughts that are going through your head and then spin them into something that is beneficial for that situation? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I think about that a lot. I probably think about <laughs> it more than I implement it. Actually, <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so what kind of shit are you doing? Like, like what the fuck are you doing outside of launch pop and outside mushrooms? Of launch- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I I read a lot. So you brought in like one of the biggest books I've ever seen in my life. It's like seven hundred pages. I know. I just I hate nonfiction. Like I know, as a business person, you're supposed to read all of these great business books, and I'm like, cool, 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 cool. cool." (laughs) You know, like that's great. (laughs) But I personally don't like reading nonfiction. I think it's. I like learning via doing versus learning via like reading, right? Everyone has their own theories. But for me, I like fiction. I like reading fantasy novels and sci-fi. And I feel like I actually get more creative and I'm better with my like articulation of words and et cetera because I'm able to like read these books that have such great like imagination components to it. And so it actually, I think, helps me more than nonfiction. Not Interesting. Lie. Yeah. Like I just become so much more imaginative and also it it makes you be more empathetic because it's always always in like someone's perspective that the story is being written right? right so i'm like so empathetic and like in my like at launch pop i have to be empathetic because like i'm dealing with founders all the time right so like <laughs> i don't know i just think that 
like I think there's like the stigma that like fiction is like a waste of time. I'm like, fuck you. Like it's actually so <laughs> much better than nonfiction. Yeah. I mean, we all live, <clears throat> we all live in some form of fiction, whether, you know, like I cannot for the life of me read a fiction book. It's just not happening. Yeah. Um, I also can't watch movies or television shows really? for the same reason. I can't do it. I can't, so I just weird. like, there's, there's like a bug in the back of my head that's yeah. like, what are you doing with your life? Get out, you know, like do, do something oh, to learn something. Yeah. Um, but in, in a similar way, like I live in fiction too, because I write poetry and I write song lyrics and I, I strum and, and create music and play songs. Like yeah. that is absolute fiction. Right. Yes. I mean, it it's it may be my nonfiction sometimes. It may be my fiction sometimes. But to whoever is listening to it, it's absolute fiction because yeah. again, it's it's a character that they totally. do not recognize yeah. as themselves. Yeah, I made this goal for myself that I would write my own book, and it was like I started writing it, and it was a fiction book. But then I realized that it I was just this. like you remember this, right? Yeah. I just realized it was actually just a story about me. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's actually interesting. Like everyone says that everyone's first novel is just like an autobiography. So for like J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter, the first one was actually like a story about her life. And like um, like Harry Potter was her, and then the bad people was her depression. Like it was like symbolic Whoa. of all the things that she went through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, um, so yeah, even with your music, I'm sure like when you started writing music, it was generally a lot about what you were feeling. And then you were able yeah. to kind of like be more, you know, imaginative and get out there. But I think everyone's first attempt at writing something is always like a reflection of how they're feeling right now or Definitely. stuff that they went through. Definitely. Yeah. That's one of those things I think I told you this a long time ago, but I could never imagine <clears throat> writing a fiction book. Like I, I write, so I've been writing songs and poetry since I was a kid. Yeah. Um, but the thought of writing a yeah. fiction book yeah. and making sure all the characters are like so, like consistent in their personality traits and how yeah. they would handle situations mm-hmm. and their interactions, that is just <gasps> like I just ran a marathon. I don't even can't even think about how difficult that would be. Yeah, totally. I have a question for you. You can ask me anything you want. Okay, dude. so relationships. Oh no. <laughs> 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 I'm just curious, like yeah. what you, I think that like, it's interesting talking to entrepreneurs about relationships because like, it's such a, it's something that everyone struggles with. Yeah. And there's no like one school of thinking, you know, yeah. some people say like two entrepreneurs can't date because they're going to be fighting over like whose business is more important, but like sometimes it works and sometimes, I don't know. What are your, what are your thoughts? What are your experiences? <laughs> <laughs> so like you, um, uh, the majority of my life, I've been a serial dater as well. So I've had a ton of long-term relationships. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I've had, uh, one since I was, you know, I don't even know, 18, one year and then a one and a half and then a two year and yeah. then a one year and then a four year and then six months of being single and a two and a half year. Yeah. And, um, you know, for the last, well, what's it been, I guess, three years, I've been single. And it's the longest period of time that I've ever been single my entire life. Yeah. Um, you know, longer than all of the cumulative time previous to that combined, um, you know, the longest yeah. single period of my life. And and during that time, it's been, you know, a big portion of uh, growth for me in my business and, and personally, mm-hmm. um, and just the other things that I'm working on. And so, I do think that uh, it, it varies person to person. I don't believe that, oh, you know, if you're you know, busy, whatever, you got to date this kind of whatever. I don't yeah. totally buy that. Yeah. Um, there may be some truth to those things, but I don't, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't think that any rule, I, I hate rules in general. Like yeah, I don't fucking yeah. believe in any of them. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's, it's essentially been like, I need to focus on me right yeah. now. And so what does that look like from a dating perspective? It's finding other people that are not interested to some extent in having a, the goal of a long-term relationship out of this thing, right. you know? And so maybe right. it's a short, a short endeavor or whatever, but for me, endeavor, endeavor <laughs> you know, um, but, but it's, it's like, I also want alignment on that up front totally. because I don't, because at least for me, like, you know, my dad raised me, you always take care of women, you always protect them. Right. Yeah. And the, the most hilarious thing is that that's like almost a controversial statement to say in this day and age, which is fucking insane. <laughs> but like, I think, you, you know, you should you should care about and protect everybody in, in yeah. your life. Right. Yeah. Um, and so he would always say, you know, when you're when you're thinking about dating women, just always do that. And so, like, I, I don't like uh, heartbreak. 
not not yeah. being the recipient of the heartbreak, but like, but the oh, disher of the heartbreak. Okay. Like it, it could it could really fuck with me. Mm-hmm. Um, so sussing that out really early on and just being clear about my intentions was mm-hmm. pretty has been pretty important historically. And then more recently, it's like hmm. So now I'm I'm past the thirty mark. <laughs> Hmm. So I need to freeze some of my swimmers. No, you don't. I gotta you get my men Michael... have a million of them. That is you true. Don't but need but, to worry but about I that. want those. But I want those fucking Michael Phelps swimmers. You know what I'm saying? Right. You yeah. want the best of the best. Uh, yeah. I don't want like the Filipino swim team. You know? <laughs> or the. You ever seen the Filipino divers at the Olympics? No, I have never. Oh man, if you ever get a chance, go on YouTube okay. and, and go. Uh, yeah, YouTube uh, Filipino dive team okay. d- doing like belly flops. It's hilarious. But anyway, like. <laughs> Like, you know, so it's like, okay, well, now I need to suss out, you know, prospective long-term relationship partners, perhaps, because in the past, I think I didn't do a good job of saying, oh, you know, maybe this will work out in 10 or 20 year time frames. It was like, oh, I could date this person for however long it goes. Yeah. And then it lasts three years. And then it's like, eh, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's been an interesting thing for me. It's It's been more intentional over the past four years call it than it's ever been in the past a lot of it just happened by happenstance before yeah and then are you ready to like put them first before your business at this point in time like no yeah that's rough huh yeah so it's like and like yeah it's hard for people because like you know you're just so used to putting your business first yeah. Everything, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a thing that's going to fuel any future potential of anything working out as well, right? right. Like, um, you know, if I was to to have a really serious relationship right now, it's like, hey, you know, if everything goes well right now, that means in a ten year time frame, everything is way better. Right. You know. Right. 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 So there's also it's a level of understanding future. that's yeah. difficult. I think if if you're you know in entrepreneurship, it's just there's so many highs and lows and, and everything in between, and things change really quick. And I think it's very tough for people that are dating someone like that mm-hmm. um, to to really understand what that's like. And mm-hmm. I've certain I've certainly felt that um, from the girls that I've dated. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's hard for them to understand why I'm staying up till one or two AM while they're sleeping working on something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. What's it been like for you? Um what's interesting is like I feel like I'm always dating founders. And really? like yeah. It's, well it's just like I'm just surrounded. I guess by you them. have, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. So when I was like single for like a year and a half I was like I am not dating any founder it's clearly like something that doesn't work and my my current partner is like a founder and he's like he has no his own company and it's been really interesting because like for him too him and I both like we always put our business first we always did um but then we met each other and we're actually putting each other first before our business which is great because like it also has to do with like um, us kind of making space between our identity versus the business's identity. It actually helps with that, like creating a small pocket mm-hmm. of your life that is exclusive of the business. Because, like, you and I are both, like, super obsessed with, like, what we do, right? So it's, like, creating that space has helped, and he's helped me create that. Yeah, and, like, it works really well. Like, he'll go through, like, you know, like staying up until 2 a.m. because of all this shit. And I'll stay up until 2 a.m. I have to wake up at 5 a.m. and fly everywhere. And we both are so empathetic to each other because we're like, we get it. And some days he comes home and he's like, holy fuck, this was the worst day ever. Should I quit? Should I do this? And then some days I come and I'm like, (laughs) oh, that was the worst day ever. Should I quit? Should I just go live in an island? And we both like, we both know what we're going through. So we just like pat each other on the back being like, it'll be over tomorrow, you know, like it's always like you get out of it. And so, so yeah, it like works a lot because that empathetic kind of side comes from both ends, but we like make a very big effort to always like put each other first before our businesses, which was not easy. It's not easy. I think that's probably the only way that it can work out. Yeah. Right. And it's interesting too, that you say like, and, and when I'm thinking about it, the empathy part, is so important Mm -hmm. and it's hard to it's it's always harder Mm -hmm. to empathize with someone if you haven't been there Mm -hmm. no matter what it is it doesn't matter how empathetic you think you are like unless you have actually been in that situation Mm -hmm. you don't have 100 percent empathy for that person and by virtue of having 
a significant other that's also a founder or, or whatever you're doing, it it does have that, right? Like when yeah. you're sitting up till 2 a.m., he's not sitting there in the bed and he's worried like, who the fuck is she talking to at 2 a.m.? <laughs> sitting here in the bed, white for this bitch, telling me she's working on a website. Like, he's not <laughs> thinking that shit. Like, he gets it. Yeah. Oh, my God. You're yeah. so good at I'm these sorry. voices. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't realize this about you. You're so good at it. You should be on Family Guy. Like, the guy, <laughs> he's a genius. I love him. The, the guy who does all the voices for uh, Family Guy. Seth something or other. So McFarland. Yeah, he's yeah. so great. He's I, love, so great. I love doing the voices. You shouldn't get me started on these things. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's like, it's interesting. Dating is interesting when you have something that you're so obsessed with like a business or a sport or something like that. Yeah. 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 I think it's hard. It's, it's just, it's a hard thing. At least it has been for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it is difficult. Like how do you maintain that thing? It's like maintaining <laughs> anything else. Like you got to maintain your car, right? Got to change yeah. the fucking oil, Yeah, you know, fill the tires up and shit like that. Yeah. Clean the windshield. <laughs> you know, I'm like trying to understand what that is metaphorically to like relationships. Don't think I'm cleaning like, the windshield. <laughs> <laughs> it's just. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, clean the windshield of your relationship. Yeah. Hmm. So for all the girls out there, <laughs> this is for all the girls that are Nick and your soul fans. What you looking for? Oh, well, um, in the long term, I think I'm uh, looking for like a nurturing, nice, intelligent. Uh, good comes from a good family, head on her shoulders, you know, baby yeah. making machine for the yeah. future. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> oh, well, um, I've covered all kinds of shit. Oh my god, everything from like work to psychedelics to relationships. Everything. Yeah. So, what what do you got to plug? We got Launch Pop. By the yeah. way, let me just go ahead and give Launch Pop a plug real quick because I always okay. do this. Like anybody ever ask me. Yeah. So. Launchpop is like one of the coolest fucking companies you can ever interact with. And they just launched some of the, the coolest shit you can possibly launch in DTC. Yeah. Um, and so where, where can they find out about all that stuff? Yeah, I mean, I guess you can go to our website, launchpop.com. Yeah. Pretty easy. Um, I, I pretty much respond to anyone who really emails us, like cold emails us, because I try to be nice. <laughs> so if you want to talk, email us. Um, or you can just follow our Instagram handle, which is launch underscore pop. You can follow me on Instagram. So Jane Lee one six. Um, yeah, a lot of the stuff I'll update on my personal stuff. So yeah. And you're having a, a pitch competition soon. Yeah. As well. I don't, I don't know when like you're going to be posting this. So like, I mean, it would have been great if it was before, but I would like it to be before. I know. So like basically, um, we partnered up with Shopify, so it's called Launch Pop Pitch, powered by Shopify. And applications are open right now. Um, we're going to be choosing 10 people from those application pool to actually pitch in real life on June 27th in downtown LA to four judges. So the judges are like, one's a VC, one works at a big corporation, one's someone from Launch Pop, um, and other um, entrepreneurs who are kind of later stage companies. And the winner will actually get 140K in investments. Um, they get to work with us and also years worth free of Shopify. Damn. Yeah. And it's, it's also a cool event because we're, it's an invite only viewing party. So it's like 150 people from LA who are investors, entrepreneurs, or people in the ecosystem. So am I invited? Dude, totally. Yes. As long as you bring Barnana. I bring whatever you want, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just let me come in. That's it also, awesome. It's also like free drinks and apps, so it's going to be like a pretty much a party too, so Sick. it'll be fun. And where can people find out about that? Is it just launchpop's website? Yeah, yeah launchpop. you can just go on the website and then just check it out. Um, unfortunately, it's an invite-only event. Of course. So, But if, if you, you want to apply. If you want to apply, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Good luck. Good yeah. luck, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> no, good luck. Good, good luck. Good luck. I say bitches uh, with all due respect. Um, <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so yeah. And if you really, get if you get the opportunity to work with Launch Pop, like you're you're truly blessed. And like when I heard you were doing this, yeah. I was reading the thing, and I'm like, fuck, I want to I want to apply, but I can't um, right oh, now. You know, but can you? No, no. it's FOMO. I mean, but you could. I could. Yeah, and yeah. I think you should. Well, 
Okay, I, Nick is going to apply. Get out of here. He's going to get it. <laughs> I'll leave that for all you people. Um, well, thanks for being on, dude. I super appreciate it. It was awesome. No, this was so much fun. And the wine it was tr- terrific. I'm even like, I can't even speak right now. I'm <laughs> slurring right now. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Woo. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the show. And thank you to Jane Lee. That was a really fun time. Also, thank you to Bar Nana. Go to barnana.com. Use code NIK to get 20% off of your order. And thank you to you. Again, if you could please subscribe to the show and shoot a five-star review, it would mean the Earth to me, um, the universe to me, the Milky Way galaxy, and maybe even the Andromeda galaxy, and all of the rest of them. Um, honestly, it really, really, really would mean a, a ton to me. If you have any feedback for the show, like shoot me some of that via email, uh, Instagram, DM, wherever you want to do it. And until next time, I will chat at y'all then.